We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Welcome to Pod Maverick After Dark, your favorite HEB slash Dune 2 superfan podcast. I'm Kirk Henderson, joined as always by Josh Bow. Sorry, we're getting a little bit of a late start. We might have been talking in pre show about HEB because that's what that's just something of interest to 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 mid 30s to to late 30s men a grocery store (laughs) good a grocery store for our for our non-texan mavericks fans by the way so that's how you really know it was a dad conversation it's Uh, it's it was yeah and and you know heb much like the dallas mavericks can really take care of business when they decide to and tonight (laughs) where the Mavericks beat the Golden State Warriors 109 to 99. I know they're playing without Steph Curry and Draymond. This is they they've now won four straight and and of this in this four game win streak. This game is is I really liked this one. This is it, the Heat win was pretty fun cuz they just needed to get on track. But this was a game where I thought the Mavericks pulled their shit together in a really functional way after kind of a a, a touch and go first quarter. Uh, and just they just closed real hard on the Warriors and probably a defensive intensity like we haven't seen uh, at least this season, not that I've seen that I can recall. Uh, what did you think of the game, man? Oh, yeah, I thought it was it was biz- <laughs> this is going to sound really silly considering what the Mavericks did right out of the All-Star break, but it kind of felt like business as usual. Mavericks yeah. take care of a of a bad team, which the Warriors are without Steph Curry. Um, like we said, after the last game, after they beat uh, Chicago, you know, that five out of six besides the Philly loss, which was a bad loss, which is, you know, that this Philly team is kind of in a similar range as this Warriors team is when they're missing their star. They just, they're very toothless. So that was definitely a bad loss, but those other four losses were, you know, two of the best offenses in the NBA and Cleveland, who was one of the, who's one of the best teams in the league, uh, since you know since the start of january i think so you know they lose to, to really good teams and they beat everyone else and that's that's been the case the mavericks entered tonight 21 and 5 against below 500 teams warriors aren't that but if this team without steph played all season they would very much be an under 500 team so it's just kind of delightful to see this team when they have games that they should take like not just they should win but this should be relatively comfortable and drama free i mean they almost they just consistently do it and tonight was no exception i know that there was some some sweet you know maybe some nervy parts in like the first half but from halftime on i mean this never really felt like a competitive game so well, credit as, to the mavericks for taking it seriously as cowboy points out in the chat you know the mavericks won a game without needing their three-point shooting they only hit one three in the first half i think that's right 
Uh, and then they hit six for the game out of 27 attempts. And it just didn't seem to matter. Uh, there's There's been a lot of consternation is the right word, but there's been a lot of talk lately about how the, at least since kind of February 1st, the the NBA has refed games differently. Like if you were a better and you just pounded the unders, you'd win, I think, something like 65% of the time since All-Star break. So the NBA can lie through their teeth all they want about how the game's being called, dif- like not being called differently. It just is. This game tonight was a great example of that. There was a lot of, it wasn't overt, it wasn't negative, but it was a physical contest at points. And the the score reflects that, 109-99. And it was it was just one of these games where the Mavericks, you know, the, they tend to die by their three point shot, and they just didn't. You know, I, this game at the rim. I mean, how many points in the paint did the Mavericks have? Do you have that up? I do. They had sixty eight points in the paint. I would guess, and I'm not being facetious here. I would guess thirty of those points came off of dunks. The Mavericks <laughs> had so many dunks. They I was were- I was really shocked. They were 24 of 30 in the restricted area. That's 80%. And they were 9 of 14 in the paint outside of the restricted area. That's 64%. League average in that spot is 44. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they killed it in the paint. This felt this felt like an almost carbon copy of the Bulls game, except uh, the Warriors had a little bit more spine than I think the Bulls did the other night. Sure. Um, sure. Offered up a little bit more resistance, at least on the defensive end. Um, but yeah, Kirk, I've got the stat to end all stats for this four game winning streak. Would you take a care to guess what the Mavericks three point shooting uh, percentages as a team during this four game win streak? 33%. You somehow went over. It is 29.3%. Jeez. They're 39 of 133 from three in this four game winning streak. And I will. Yeah. Not look this up yet. Maybe you'll look it up later, but I will wager to guess that this is probably the best the Mavericks have played over a four-game stretch while shooting under 30% from three as a team since the Luka Doncic era started. Um, Really unbelievable when you think, especially last season. Like, I know they didn't win a lot of games last season, and funny enough, the Mavericks just matched their season win total from last season tonight. But they did not get blown out a lot, despite the fact that they lost a lot of games. And they didn't because they were just consistently making 17, 18, 19, even 23s almost every game. Uh, And when they didn't, that's when they did get blown out. Um, So the fact that this team has so quickly kind of reversed that trend now, you know, still a little early. I mean, they still, I think early in the season, they were still kind of three-point happy in terms of their win-loss record. But since the trade deadline, it feels like they've been winning much differently uh, with the additions of PJ Washington, Daniel Gafford. They now have a true center rotation to get them through 48 minutes. Um, obviously, those two have some issues against some of the better teams that can space the floor with a with a big with a shooting big like Indiana or Boston. But not every team is Indiana or Boston. And when the Mavericks play against a team with a weak front line like Golden State is without Draymond Green. Uh, like Chicago when, without Patrick Williams, and, and they're basically playing like four guards and, and Nikola Vucevic, who's having a horrible season. They're feasting, man. They're absolutely feasting. Um, it's been really fun to watch. Um, and Luca like, had a pretty pedestrian game, and they, like, it never felt in doubt. Like, that's a pretty cool thing for him. That's a rare thing for this team over the last six years. So, yeah. Well, and we'll circle back to the Luca. Uh, he exited the game with a apparent hamstring injury. Jason Kidd says, as of now, they're unsure whether Luca will make the trip to Oklahoma City. Um, I'm really curious to see what happens there because, I mean, I think Luca always wants to play. Uh, hamstring stuff is obviously something you have to be very careful with, even for a more floor bound player. Um, this hamstring stuff sucks. It's it's way to go, but. I, I there's a lot of really positive things I think we could we could touch on with this game. I think the thing I I want to start with uh, would be I'd been sort of looking for Kyrie Irving to have a really strong performance for several games now. Now you go look at his box score and you'd say, well, Kyrie's played some really good games. What are you talking about? This really felt like like an element of the Kyrie experience that we were getting in January uh, when Luca was out. You know, 23 points, 10 assists, eight rebounds. This was a 
This was like a it was a fun game. His three isn't going his three didn't go down either, just like the rest of the teams. But he he was playmaking in a way we've not gotten to see very much of just because of how teams have been guarding the Mavericks. And I don't know. I just I I like the experience. Ten assists to one turnover. Pretty nice. Yeah, by far his most assists in the last two months. Um he ties his season high for assists. Oh wow. Um he did it three previous times. So this is only the fourth time he's had ten, at least ten assists. Uh, so that's a big deal because we've been kind of wondering, you know, during especially during the, the 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 five of six losing stretch where the offense was kind of dying on a vine whenever Luca yeah. went to the bench. It was like, I know that Kyrie has historically played, you know, he played with LeBron, played with Durant, played with James Harden for like the last five years, five to six years. Even in Boston, you know, he had some some decent supporting cast there. Like he's still really good, like a really good passer, and it was just I mean, kind of it's bizarre. Like excellent point guard. It's just yeah. I, it was, I, it was, I, yeah. Go ahead. I really like seeing what he. I I think and and it feels this way to me. I feel like he enjoys being the secondary playmaker more than the primary playmaker, which is where Dante Exum can really come in handy. But giving you know give him the chance to run an offense uh, like he did tonight, and it's just you get some some nice results. I mean, it's. Obviously, I don't expect Kyrie to throw up 10 assists every game with the role that they have in the offense. But, you know, he threw an oop to Daniel Gafford that was like <laughs> just breathtaking shit. I, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I really like good passing games. I mean, the yeah. Mavericks as a whole had 30 assists on 44 made field goals. That's that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And considering all the mysteries that they had that many assists and they only I mean, they still shot 53 percent from the floor so like they were still killing it they just didn't i mean if they made their threes they would have scored like 140 points tonight yep. so it, it read the, the threes really do, and the threes and the turnovers really do mask like what was otherwise a pretty clean pretty good offensive game mm-hmm. yeah the thing with Kyrie, i think um what was really nice about tonight uh is that when luca went out of the game so i think he went out of the game with about five minutes left maybe a little over five minutes left and obviously the game, like the Mavericks had a double digit lead. I think it was 16 points with, with, you know, five minutes left. That should be a win, even if you're just, you know, running out the clock, so to speak. But the thing that was nice was we've seen with Luca off the floor and Kyrie on, sometimes Kyrie really likes to defer um, and likes the space and, and staying in the corner. Not because he can't, he just, yeah, you know, he just he's spots. Yeah. And he's like one of the best catch and shoot shooters ever so it's not like the worst thing in the world for him to be spotting up uh even when luke is off the floor but he was very assertive like he he was running the offense it wasn't necessarily you know he was bringing them all off the floor he was getting guys into he was getting them into their sets he was running the primary pick and roll like it was good to see him kind of take control of the ball down the stretch in the fourth quarter and basically even if luca you know we'll see if luca is really hurt or if it was more of a precautionary thing uh, it was really good to see because if Luca doesn't play tomorrow, he's going to have to be like that from opening tip to the end of the game if they want to have a chance to win. Um, so, yeah, it was just – he was really assertive. And it wasn't necessarily – like when we say he was really assertive, that doesn't mean he just needs to get up like 25 shots. Like it's mm-hmm. just can you can command the ball? Can you control the ball? Because you're a really talented offensive player and good things happen when the ball's in your hands. So. Yeah. And that's what happened tonight. Only, yeah, the the one turn, ten, 10 assists, one turnover. Yeah, that's really. You you got me thinking. I don't want to spoil my man's work, but there's a friend of mine. His name's Jared Dubin. He's written all over the place, but he runs the Substack, which uh, you know I, I I pay for it because I I try to support my friend's good work. But he he offers elements of a free version called Last Night in Basketball. I'm posting it in um posting it in the chat, and he he is eventually going to put up this post on movement shooting. Uh, versus stationary shooting you actually did I, did I inspire him you, you specifically inspired him he he told <laughs> me he was like and that was why I was like you should message him the other day I need, yeah I need him um but he he's got some data on Kyrie this is why I was kind of gushing about Kyrie after the last game where the advanced data on Kyrie's shooting at the moment is just because he doesn't do super high volume I don't think a lot of people notice it but it's it's laugh out loud funny it's like approaching clay thompson level chicanery like at his peak where it's just this is the kind of shots he's getting the offense but i'm what i like about Kyrie playing off ball and i'll be looking forward to seeing it tomorrow night if if luca is out is the mavericks don't have anyone that's that's really dynamic off the dribble 
I mean, PJ Washington tries and he, he has moments, but I don't like where he has to be dynamic off the dribble versus can take advantage of certain situations. So if Axelman runs the point and Kyrie can still be kind of the, the, the release valve and the playmaker versus the, the, you know, the, the guy who starts the Mavericks weird, um, Non offense, <laughs> their high school <laughs> stuff. So, I, I don't know that 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 should be fun. Um, where are we at on time? We're already at 14 minutes. All right, there's there's lots of fun stuff that I think Josh and I are going to circle back to in this game, but I'm going to take a minute to ask you guys to go ahead and like the uh video stream if you're watching on YouTube or on Twitter. If you have that ability, that sort of thing very much helps us. If you are here at YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to the show. Um, there's plenty of things that you can do, some of which I don't understand, that will actually notify you when we go live. We go live after every game. We try to do this uh, within a few minutes of the game ending. Tonight was not one of those nights because Josh and I were talking about HEB. Um, but we'll, 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 as the year goes on, we'll get a little better. I'm going to host a secondary show tonight, which I think you guys should should participate in. And and you know that way you can hang out and talk and ask questions and that sort of thing. If you're listening on an audio stream, uh, the next day, if you're listening here on on Thursday before the Thunder game, go ahead and uh, you know shoot me an email, give us a, a review. Five stars are preferred, but if you like making fun of me, I do see those zero star reviews where people will pick something very mean to say, but those make me laugh. Um, thanks so much for uh, for supporting the show. I'm going to cut right now on the audio stream to some ads, and Josh and I will be right back. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for playoff home court, there's no shortage of high-stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000 with NBA, NHL, and college basketball entries today on Prize Picks. Prize Picks even offers injury insurance so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. This week on Prize Picks, I'm selecting Giannis Antetokounmpo for more than 32.5 points and LeBron James for more than 8.5 assists. Download the app today and use code BLUEWIRE for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code BLUEWIRE on the Prize Picks app for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Prize Picks. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. So, what if I told you that Daniel Gafford and Derek <laughs> Lively have combined over two professional basketball games to shoot 91% from the floor? They are 32 of 35 over the last two games. That is that's nuts. I mean, we're watching it and it's like not shocking like the number because it I even like and the misses are obviously the couple of misses are from Lively like I don't even remember the lively misses. Like he got blocked he, on one, okay. <laughs> and then caught caught his own block and calmly reversed dunked. Okay. I just can't emphasize how rare that is for a young big to to be this okay. And when I mean okay, I mean he just shit doesn't seem to frazzle him. No, no, it doesn't. And I think it's really cool that he is coming off the bench and really hasn't skipped a beat. Like, I think there was some concern from the fan base. Like, what would him coming off the bench do to maybe his psyche? Hit, you know, he's, he was theoretically hitting the rookie wall. He had kind of had a couple of of meager performances stringed together during that five and five out of six losing stretch. 
Um, had some bad matchups against teams that can really stretch him out and away from the rim. And like we've said all the time, like he did not guard anyone at Duke, even closely resembling like a Miles Turner or Kristaps Porzingis mm-hmm. uh, or guarding, you know, guarding in space. Like he had to guard Darius Garland and, and Donovan Mitchell in the pick and roll. It's Cleveland, you know, like it's just tough. Those were some tough matchups for him. Um, and for him to kind of come back from that, play against some teams that are small uh, that he has the advantage with and assert that advantage while coming off the bench and not letting that mess him up at all. It's impressive to go along with Gafford, who I guess is not going to miss a shot for the rest of his life. And we're going to be telling our grandkids about the the NBA player who shot 90% for his career. Cause this is crazy. He's up to 33 in a row. I don't know when he's missing his next one. It's very difficult to contextualize this sort of stat because um do you do you have yeah you don't listen to any podcasts what am i talking about <laughs> there is a a really en- there's a really enjoyable show like this is a for a, if you just like basketball to like it jason concepcion and shay serrano run a a show called six trophies that they do once a week and chase serrano talked about he's like if i go nine for nine there's no way i'm finishing nine for nine i'm gonna keep i'm just gonna keep shooting i'll finish nine for 26 but if i start off like that you can't convince me to not shoot and it's just watching gafford it's like he's extra locked in because number one he's very aware of the streak which is after the chicago game yes for sure but during, during the chicago game he he was figuring that he got the ball like three times in sort of like the Dirk short corner area with a face up opportunity and did not look at the rim. Now, to be fun, to be candid, I'm fine with that because if he wants to pass to a cutter, like he found Dante Exum at one point in the game for like a nice little cut in the lane for a layup, all the better because one of the things we've criticized uh, um, Gafford for earlier in his uh, brief Mavericks tenure is kind of his willingness to just shoot whatever is near the rim. Uh, and I think it's making him a little bit more of a, not necessarily a threat, but it's like, I think teams expect him to go up with everything. So, you know, if, if he comes across and, and actually, you know, beats this Wilt Chamberlain record, I'm just, it's going to, it's going to be nothing short of amazing because it's, this is just one of these stats that I wouldn't have ever considered because basketball players miss shots. I sat, you know, before the game, I was telling everybody uh, I was a little late to uh, to posting the game thread at Mavs Moneyball because I'm outside with Parker and and that's my eight year old son and like I was trying to teach him the mic and drill, <laughs> which didn't go so well, but we were having fun and it's like just watch like doing anything 33 times in a row feels impossible and yet he's just doing this in a professional basketball game. So I I, don't, I hope it happens. I really do. It'll be a oh. silly. It'll be a silly fun thing to talk about because it ultimately doesn't matter, but it's really fun. Be- beating Will Chamberlain at any NBA stat is worthy of celebration and praise. And beating Will Chamberlain at a stat involved around like scoring buckets or shooting around the basket is doubly so because that guy owns just about every ridiculous scoring record there is uh, in the NBA. Um, and I'm honestly like, if you would have told me that the record was like 50 in a row and it was belonged to Wilt, I'd be like, yeah, that tracks because sure. he was outrageous. Like he was like a myth. Like he was so outrageously good, uh, for his era. Um, so yeah, I, I think he's going to get it because at this point he's very like, <laughs> he is not taking shots that are not like, like it'll, it'll only happen if he like slit, like boofs a dunk attempt or something, because he's very clearly going to get to that 36, uh, only take shots he knows he can make. And then maybe, you know, we'll see some, you know, we'll see the the pressure maybe rain off of a little bit. Not that it looks like he's, there's a lot of pressure on him right now, but he's very clearly, like you said, he's aware and he should be. And, and by the way, like he hasn't necessarily, like, you know, I haven't really seen him necessarily pass up looks that he normally would take. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, he made that, that, that pass to the cutter, but you typically don't, always want Gafford like doing anything other than what he's doing right now, which is catching and finishing, you know, opportunities from his playmakers. So that's the nice thing about it is even if he is a little extra cautious, it's not really hurting the team because this is kind of what he does anyway. Um, And defensively, he's probably played four of his better, his 
four best defensive games since he's come to the Mavericks have probably come all in this winning streak. Um, definitely the matchup's better. And this is why, like, we got to talk about, I don't know how we talk about this without, I don't want to make anyone mad, but we have to talk about, like, there's just, like, context is so important. When okay. there's so many games, there's so many different teams, there's so many different matchups because there was all that noise during the five of six um, when the Mavericks were you know losing five of six and Gaffer wasn't playing a lot. And it was like, he needs to play more. This is part of the reason they're losing. And it's like, guys, like he's kind of contributing to the losing, even though he's not playing. Like that's why he's not playing a lot because he wasn't playing well defensively or the scheme that the Mavericks were asking to play was not, you know, working. Like it's not like he was, Don, like you know he's not like he was throwing up 10 and 11 and, and 15 minutes and then the team was not closing with him like he was for the most part not playing well defensively in those losses now if you want to peg that on the coaching staff that's fine but you know they something needed to change and so there's kind of this sense that like i think the mavericks are undefeated when he starts and i think yep. there, i saw like he's two and four when he comes off the bench and everyone's pointing at that like see like he needs to start and it, and it's like no like he just ran into some bad matchups like sure. he, the Pacers and the, and the Celtics and even the Cavaliers to a degree with the way that they run offense. It's difficult for him to guard because he, at least so far, has not shown himself to be like a, a switching big. Now, if you think that he can switch and that's on the Mavericks coaching staff for not allowing him to, you know, fine. But just with how the Mavericks play with Lively and Gafford, uh, it was just tough for him. And now, you know, the Heat. The, the Heat, the Warriors without Draymond, like the Bulls, um, the Pistons, like all teams that Gafford, like much better matchup and they look better. And it's like, so it's not necessarily like play Gafford and start him a lot and they'll win. It's just play the matchups right. Like there are going to be games where Lively or even Maxi Kleba are going to be more advantageous to you over Gafford. And that's not a slight against Daniel Gafford. It's just maximizing your players to the best that you can and, and, and maximizing your chances to win a game. And, you know, not every team is going to be like the Warriors or the Bulls who don't, you know, the Warriors starting center basically is, is a rookie without Draymond. And then the Bulls, Vucevic is having a terrible year and they basically have no power forwards. Like, yes, of course, play Gafford a lot in those matchups because he's going to dominate in the paint against those kind of teams. Uh, so again, it's, I don't know. I'm not trying to be critical of Gafford necessarily. It's just more, there's just got, there's just more to it than start him, play him 26 sure. minutes. You're going to win. You know? Well, and I got, you know, I got some grief from, from people who know things about my take where I'm like, you just can't convince me that Maxi's supposed defensive prowess is more important to what Dallas tries to do in some of these lineups than Gafford and Lively's offensive functionality. I absolutely. Like Maxi has been so <laughs> fucking bad. He's just he's just been so and, and but here's the thing: there's gonna be a moment where the Mavericks need Maxi. Hasn't they, that haven't that been what we've been saying for like the last three years? Is like it's not that we need Maxi to necessarily go away, it's just their only good basketball can't be reliant on him playing. I mean, Mark Followell roasted the guy. That doesn't happen. Did you hear that? Were you in there? Know. He's uh, like, like he pointed out how bad Maxie's been in the podcast. Oh, on offense, he's, yeah. Yeah, he's like, oh my God. Yeah, he's only scored eight, eight points this month. So. Mm -hmm. And he only played eight minutes tonight, which is fine. Yes. Like they didn't need him. You know, right. Like, there's going to be a game where they need him. So yes. that's kind of my point. I just, I don't, I don't know. This It's, it's not a silly conversation because it's going to be the sort of thing uh, that comes up in a big game um sorry i keep looking to the side because there's a mosquito hawk flying around my oh, room. Oh, no. these are nuts this time of year good oh, no. lord um i it, it's just it's just gonna be a thing is is where we settle on it um i'm trying to look at like the the, the only other like like box score and this is not an oddity pj washington had a phenomenal game he was four of five inside the three-point line uh to go along with seven rebounds two assists and three blocks um, the, the block party the Mavericks had tonight was hysterical. 13 blocks, um, on the night. And PJ, had seven. <laughs> mm -hmm. PJ just, just having a really solid, I mean, solid doesn't even do it justice. He had a great game. Um, I, I had a really, I, I had a really fun one, uh, with, with regards to this. So, um, the PJ thing is interesting because, you know, his offense has really not been there 
in a way that I kind of thought it would. He's making the shots that I think he needs to make in the paint. But, you know, his three-point shot has basically been non-existent. Um, and that was happening in Charlotte, so it's not too terribly surprising. But there's always, you hope, there's going to be the Luka bump with the shooting. But the thing with PJ that he's showing, and this is like, you know, why he's been such a, a – he's having – sorry, I'm I'm kind of getting, you know, ahead of myself. Okay. But like comparing him to Grant Williams – um, which might not be fair, but the reason why he's able to have these winning, impactful games, despite the fact that he's not shooting or scoring consistently, which, you know, Grant also wasn't shooting or scoring consistently, is just his defensive fit and his defensive level has been astronomically higher at that four spot than what Grant Williams was giving the team for most of the season. Like his ability to play big and rotate and, and, guard in one-on-one situations and when they don't ask him to help off the strong side corner for three which i feel like has changed a little bit since they had that that last loss to the pacers uh that over helping seems to have been stamped out a little um he's just his defense has been dynamite otherwise like and this is kind of like what we talked about the trade like it was like he has the tools he absolutely has the tools and hearing from you know i think zach lowe on his podcast said from what he heard, he wants to be coached. Like it's not an issue of him not working hard or not wanting to be a coach. It was just, he kind of gave his poor effort on a bad team, which kind of happens. It snowballs when you're on a bad team, like the the Hornets. I still think he shoots the ball. Like I, I question his vision. Yeah. I don't know what's going on there. It is like, it is like early. it, It sometimes his shot attempts make Sean Marion's shot look pretty. Like it is a like look out below type instance because he'll just miss like he'll shoot from the wing and it'll be gorgeous and then he'll shoot from the corner and I question his depth perception. Does he need new contacts? Something. Does he need contacts? Yeah. Something, man. I'll it's weird, you. but at least you know that's going to be a problem in the playoff. Like he can't he can't shoot twenty nine percent from three in a playoff series. That'll be tough. So they'll need to figure that part out and maybe move him around the floor like you've been talking about get him in those better positions to score in the paint. Cause he's that floater feels pretty automatic. Like yep. when he's going to the basket, but defensively, like he's showing when he's not doing the overhelping, which I think is not him. That's a scheme thing. Mm-hmm. Like his defense is like end of game, high leverage playoff level playoff caliber. Like he's really playing well defensively. Did, did Josh Green continue to play in garbage time? How in the world is he a negative eight on this game? I thought he had a nice, yeah, he put, yeah, he finished the game. I think okay. he finished the game. Then that's yeah. Then I'm ignoring. No, he had a great. Yeah, he had a nice game. He had a very nice game. Uh, trying to think if there's anything else to note. Is there? I don't know. Um, Exum off the bench, six assists, one turnover. Beautiful. Like just continuing to mm. be like right around that four to six assist mark, which is just huge for the bench. Um, Tim Hardaway Jr. can't shoot, but like it's it's interesting, like. What was the, I don't even remember. What was the record last year when he shot under 40% from three? Uh, it was bad. And mm. he's been like under 35 for almost two months now. And the Mavericks are like 12 and five, basically. Like, I think it goes to show like the the trade deadline improvements um, and kind of how this team has kind of shifted a little bit that they're able to survive this. Like, and he's not playing a lot. Like, I, I think that's another big thing from this game is that I, it feels like to me the rotation feels right. Like the starting lineup, you know, get nitpicky with Gafford or Lively. Maybe there's a matchup where Lively starting makes more sense. But both of those guys playing over 20 minutes, like that's really all you need. Um, but like everything else feels like it's falling into place. Like putting Derek Jones Jr. in for Josh Green in the starting lineup was massive because Josh Green just cannot guard screens to save his life. Um, and I feel like in a starting lineup to start games when you're going against the, the other team's best players and so many teams run, you know, pick and roll with their dominant ball, dominant guard, like having Jones on the floor to start games makes so much more sense. Um, Green seems to play much better off the bench. He gets a little bit more touches. Uh, he seems to have a, I don't know, just seems to be a little bit of a weight off his shoulders. Like Hardaway's minutes are down. Kleba's minutes are down. Uh, Exum's minutes are, are creeping back up. Like I don't, it feels like they're kind of locking in the rotation of the lineup right now. And that's what you want to see uh, in mid March as you're trying to make the playoff push. Well, I am, I, I couldn't be more delighted. You know, the Mavericks play Oklahoma city tomorrow night. 
Uh, that game is going to be really interesting because if Luka Doncic doesn't play, um, that's going to be an uphill battle. But I do think the Mavericks, the way they've been crushing in the paint, is going to be pretty interesting. I still Gafford think they, and Lively Gafford ate him up last time. Right. I I, I don't want to I don't act like it's a game the Mavericks throw their hands up. It's just going to be a, a kind of a more calculated, interesting game. Then on Sunday they play the the Denver Nuggets. So these these two contests you know, our, our uphill battles and the Mavericks could very easily go 0 and 2, which is why this four game win streak feels so useful because it's, you know, the, the right now there's there's a lot going on in NBA action. The Los Angeles Lakers uh, who just are on and look, man, I, I know how this shit works, but I get so tired of every fucking podcast being how could the Lakers do da 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 anybody that's been the 10 seed in the time that we've had the um the playing tournament hasn't gone anywhere. Like it, it's, I, I'm pretty sure they haven't made the playoff. Like it, it's just this constant like drumbeat for the Lakers, where it's like they've had incredibly healthy seasons from LeBron and and AD, and they still kind of suck. It's it's largely, and hear me out here, it's because they got Christian Wood, and every team he goes to becomes worse. It's really magical. I love it so so much. Um, this is a big win for the box score or for the play in folks too, because the Kings are just hanging out on on the back end of the plan. Like this is. It's and, the Kings are gonna, and the Kings are going to win against right. the Lakers tonight. So, yeah. Right. So, it's, it, you know, we're kind of looking, you know, we, all of us. So, so New Orleans has 39 wins. Phoenix has 38 wins. Sacramento has 37 wins. Dallas has 38 wins. Uh, we're going to have three teams with 38 wins here very shortly. Uh, and, and it, uh, you know, the Mavericks, I think, still have two games against the Kings. Kings are just not a good matchup for the Mavericks. Um, the way they play basketball. So it's there. It's really fun. Like I know certain people hate the plan, um, but this is just, it's a great way. It makes this part of the season feel meaningful. And if you're a younger basketball fan, it's kind of hard to contextualize that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This where, is normally the dog days. Yeah. Of, unless of we're calendar. talking like prime Western conference where the Suns miss the playoffs with 48 wins. Right. Um, yeah. It's, it's just, it's a different world. Um, because Jeremy usually Patton. those those nine ten teams are and the eleven because now eleven has something to play for, they're they're like they're done right now, like they're not doing anything. So you've basically got like maybe what 10, 15, 10, 12 to fifteen teams at this point of the season were yeah. really trying. That's uh, right, which made it really difficult back in the day. Uh, to That's watch right, consistently. Okay, so I'm going to let Josh go edit and post stuff to MazMoneyBall.com um, because he is an excellent editor, and I am really bad at spelling. Um, I saw something. This is really off topic, but whatever. I saw uh, my our, our colleague Brent sent me this story about how these kids got punished for using Grammarly, and I'm just like, I wouldn't be able to function without using Grammarly. <laughs> Like, I don't know how like, I am not a editor. I am a manager. I need these things to work and it just killed me. But uh, all right. So this has been fun, Josh. And I'll be back late tomorrow night after the Oklahoma city game. Thanks so much for hanging out, Josh and everybody that's hanging out in here. I will be right back to start our secondary live show. You see the link. It should be pinned into the chat. You can join that show. Those of you who are listening on audio only look for that show to post right around lunchtime. Everybody else have a great night and go Mavs.